Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. My name is Peter Engler. I am here with uh, my remarkable co-host, Amanda. Peter, you're always so kind to me. I, well, I'm so you grateful. Know, you you got to be kind to your co-host. We, yeah. have, we have about 45 minutes together on suffering. So All right, buckle up. Could get bad. So <laughs> we're also here with our excellent uh, producer, Dan Austin, and we're so glad to be here. We are here with Will and Bill Kynes. We're asking the question, why do I feel like I have to be happy all the time. They wrote a book on wrestling with Job. We're going to talk a little bit more about that book and what it has to do with suffering. It's a book of the Bible. So we'll get a little bit more background. So I don't know, Amanda, any thoughts before we throw it to uh, Bill and Will? I am all ears for this one. All right. Hey, let's go. Hey, so before we get started, why don't you both give us a little bit of an intro? Bill, we'll start with you. Why don't you share a little bit of your story and faith journey? And then Will, you can just follow up right after him. Well, thank you, and uh, it's good to be with you. I uh, had a sort of generic church background as a kid, but nothing really took. Uh, so by the time I was an early teenager, I called myself agnostic and really didn't think uh, Christianity was for me. But as I got into high school, I came into contact with Young Life Ministry and some uh, guys who worked with uh, high school kids that made a big impact on my life. And, and through their involvement with me, I, I began to take seriously the message of Jesus and made a commitment to Christ when I was in high school. And then went off to a big state university and was invited to a church. And that church really was formative in my life. Uh, there was biblical preaching that just challenged me both intellectually and morally and spiritually. And that's when I began to develop a sense of, uh, I want to be involved in this. And I began to take the Bible seriously. I ended up uh, studying philosophy as an undergraduate because I was interested in philosophical issues as it related particularly to theology. Uh, and just began to pursue <clears throat> theological studies uh, over many years uh, <laughs> and finally graduated with a PhD. And, in New Testament and landed up in a church in uh, Northern Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. And I spent 36 years there as a pastor and just recently retired. So that's a little bit of my story. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 44 years. Uh, we have four sons who are all married. You're going to meet one of them in a minute. And we have 14 grandchildren. Uh, uh, my story has a lot to do with that voice that you just heard. <laughs> so my dad, Bill, uh, grew up uh, in his church and um, uh, profiting from his fathering uh, in my family and um, uh, so grew up in that kind of context. But <clears throat> it wasn't really until I went off to college that I made my faith my own and uh, again, Young Life was influential for me as well. Uh, as I was a Young Life leader there, and it was through leading Young Life that I felt a call to ministry and then had to determine what that ministry would look like. And over a period of years and several degrees, <laughs> uh, I see that, you know, doing biblical studies is where uh, I see the Lord has called me to. Uh, and uh, so also did a PhD at Cambridge, though in Old Testament, not in New Testament, uh, like my dad. So, you know, I, the, the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. Uh, and um, then uh, after Cambridge, I taught at a school in Spokane, Washington for six years uh, called Whitworth University and came to Samford uh, three and a half years ago, uh, where I teach biblical studies, both to undergrads and then do some teaching for the seminary here, Beeson Divinity School. Wonderful. Great. Thank you for sharing your stories. That gives us a little picture into who you both are. Um, how did you decide to write a book on Job? Why Job? What's the heart behind it? Give us all the details. You know, some people with their father, you know, they make a deck or, you know, they go on a trip. You guys write a book on Job, you know? <laughs> well, um, I think the book developed uh, jointly in, in many ways. Uh, in some respects, it began with Will's PhD studies. He did his PhD on the book of Job. Hmm. And then it developed also through my preaching ministry at the church. I, I had been 
at the church over 30 years, and I had never preached from the book of Job. It was one of the few books of the Bible that I never really preached through. And I felt like, oh, gosh, you know, I think our church needs this because the church needs the whole counsel of God. And this was part of the counsel of God that hadn't really been been expounded to the church. So um, I uh, took a sabbatical break from the church, and one of the projects was to study Job. And Will and I had a lot of conversations about the book of Job, and I found them very helpful. And so I preached a series of uh, 10 sermons on the book of Job, and Will and I were in constant conversation during that period. And then uh, the book really was uh, evolved out of that preaching series and our conversations. And uh, so the book is essentially a uh, exposition of the book of Job, going through it, uh, appreciating its literary form with a contribution of Will's more academic notes uh, throughout the book. So it's a combination of pastoral preaching and academic study of the book. Yeah, it was well, such that, a delight to have that opportunity to engage with my dad about the book, uh, have those conversations each week as he was planning his sermons. And then after the sermon, you know, I would listen to it and then we would talk about uh, how it went. And so we just felt like, why, why couldn't we share that with the general public, uh, this kind of engagement between a pastor and a biblical scholar on how we interpret this text uh, and draw on what we can learn from biblical scholarship, but then put it to work in a pastoral context, uh, in the context of the church. So uh, how did those feedback sessions go? You know, I mean, it, it, <laughs> well, it was, it was a joy because I would ask, well, did you, did you listen to the sermon? And then I was like, how'd I do? How'd I do? <laughs> so there was a kind of reversal of roles in the father son relationship. Yeah, but it, was, it was a great delight. It was. And, you know, that kind of process continued throughout the writing of the book. You know, growing up, I don't think I ever wrote an essay for any school paper. I mean, even my Ph.D. dissertation I sent to my dad to read and give me feedback on. And, you know, he's marked up every essay I've ever read. I've ever, I've ever written with red marks everywhere. But I got the opportunity finally to return the favor and take his <laughs> sermons as we reworked it into a book uh, and, you know, note, I don't know, think we need a comma there or we need to splice <laughs> these two sentences and these kinds of things. So it, it, that has been a really fun process. That's great. I find it very interesting that you look back at your time, Bill, in the church and say, I never preached on Job. Like, I love that. And yeah. My question to you would be, if you felt it was necessary to go back and write this book, I mean, for multiple reasons, but you're thinking, I need to, my church needs this. Why do they need that? If, if Job wasn't in the Bible, what would we be missing? I think the church needs it because of the reality of suffering in this fallen world. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that one of my roles as a pastor was to prepare people to suffer. Mm -hmm. And, and because it, it's it's inevitable. We all suffer, uh, some more spectacularly than others, but we all suffer. And in the end, we all experience the tragedy of death. Uh, and, and I think this is a big theme in the Bible. And, and Job, perhaps as much as any place in the Bible, wrestles with the reality of pain and suffering in this fallen world. Uh, so I, I felt it was helpful for the congregation to be exposed to the message of this book. You know, Will, let's let's ask that academically and theologically. What's missing if Job's not in the Bible? So Job <clears throat> Job takes an important theme that we do see elsewhere in the Bible, this theme of wrestling with God in the midst of suffering. And it takes it, it turns it up to 11, so to speak, right? Uh, it takes that theme all the way to the extreme. And in lots of ways, Job is an extreme book. Uh, some have described it as a kind of thought experiment in which we get these extreme settings, right? The most righteous man suffers in the most horrible way, right? And then how does he respond? Well, he takes this idea of wrestling with God and he really, really wrestles with God uh, over the course of his um, prayers, his argument with his friends, but it becomes an argument with God as well. And this is what I think Job really offers to us in scripture is because of the way that God responds to Job at the end, we see that God approves mm 
of what Job says, right? At the end of the book, Job says, God says to Job's friends, you have not spoken of me rightly as my servant Job has. Uh, and even before God gives that explicit approval, the fact that God responds to Job at the end of the book and speaks to him in the midst of his suffering also is an affirmation that what Job has done in calling God to respond is something that God wanted Job to do. So within the Bible, Job plays this important function of taking these ideas we see elsewhere of, you know, Jacob wrestling with the angel or Abraham um, arguing with God about whether to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah or Moses arguing with God not to destroy the people or the lament Psalms that we see where people are bringing their pain to God. Uh, and it gives us a strong affirmation of that as a way to respond to God in the midst of our suffering. That that's super helpful. Let's let's kind of jump here for a second because I I feel like it's important. Not all uh, I think probably the majority of our listeners struggle with this question of why would a good God allow suffering? Mm -hmm. You know why can't I be happy? Sometimes Christians that word happy is not. It's kind of a trigger word. Are we supposed to be happy? Are we supposed to be joyful? Mm -hmm. So what Amanda and I are gonna do is. We're going to pretend that one of you is Joe Buck and the other one's Troy Aikman. I'll let you pick which one is which. Why don't, why don't, you, um, why don't you give us kind of an overview and a play-by-play -play of Job, just the story and the structure, and you two kind of go back and forth just to give our listeners, and even for those that know the story, just kind of maybe a five to seven minute perspective on it so that as we kind of talk about it, they kind of know the gist of where you're going with this. Yeah, so I'll be the play-by-play -play guy, and uh, Bill can be the color guy, uh, <laughs> jumping in as he wants. Uh, so the story starts, as I mentioned, with an introduction to Job as this superlatively faithful man, right? He is righteous in every way, and along with that righteousness comes great blessing. So he has flocks and flocks of um, sheep and cattle, and he has 10 children. So he's the greatest man in the East. But the Satan comes and challenges Job's faith. He says to God um, that Job only worships God because of the stuff that God has given him. But if you were to take away all that, all those blessings that God has given, then Job would curse God to his face. And that becomes what's sometimes called the wager. That's God agrees. Okay, fine, Satan, take those things away from Job. Um, and you'll see that he'll remain faithful. And so chapters one and two of the book set out that initial setting and then describe how Job loses everything. He loses all of his possessions. He loses all of his children. He eventually loses all of his health. Um, he's covered in boils, but he remains faithful, right? And, and this is where we get the famous words from Job. Um, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me just throw in here. I think yeah. um, part of the role of the, the, the Satan, this, this adversary figure, is he, he's very cynical. Hmm. Uh, he, he's really questioning whether there really is such a thing as as goodness itself or that God himself is worthy of worship to, apart from the good things that he gives. And, and in a sense, he represents that cynical theme that we see even in our own culture, that there really is nothing to goodness, truth, and beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all shams. If you just look under the surface, there's really nothing there. And, and he represents that very cynical theme uh, that uh, is, I think, very evident in our culture today. Yeah. And his challenge of Job's faith is really a challenge to whether God himself is worthy of faith. Uh, he presents the issue as if since Job is only loving God for the things that he gives him, God wouldn't be worth loving if he weren't lavishing gifts upon someone. And so both God and Job's reputation are at stake in what will follow in the rest of the book. So initially Job responds with a submissive type of faith, but in chapter three, that turns to a more defiant kind of faith mm -hmm. where he curses the day of his birth. Now he doesn't curse God and that's significant, but mm -hmm. he does express vociferously how frustrated he is with his situation where he as a righteous man has experienced this 
terrible, devastating suffering in a way that he doesn't think that he deserves. Well, Job's friends have come with the purpose of comforting Job. We're told that in chapter 2, verse 11. But after Job speaks in that way, <clears throat> the friends, they actually turn on Job. So they start to accuse Job, first of not speaking appropriately to God, and eventually they start to accuse him of actually great iniquity, of sinning mm. against God. He must have done something really terrible that God would allow this kind of thing to happen to him. And most of the book is this argument between Job and his friends about Job's situation and why he's in that situation. But as the argument continues, the friends turn more against Job, but Job starts to basically ignore the friends and turn against God. He realizes that it's really God with which he has to do in this situation. And so he's calling on God to make things right, to respond to him, and God seems absent. God does not reply for yeah. chapter after chapter after chapter. Do you want to yeah. jump in and on it, that? Yeah, well, the, the friends in some way represent this very strict kind of uh, view <clears throat> that people always get what they deserve in this life. This idea that there is strict retribution. There is uh, uh, good deeds will be rewarded and bad deeds will be penalized. And that's the way life is. And uh, so if you've got lots of good things, you must be righteous. And if you, bad things happen to you, it's your fault. And, and they press that. And w w one of the things that I think is interesting is about the way we kind of do that in our own lives. When we see somebody who suffers, we want to distance ourselves from them. We want to, we want to say, what was it that they did that caused that suffering? Because if we can identify that, then we're safe. And in some ways, the friends wanted to be safe in their own relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Because if random things can happen, then uh, they can happen to me anytime. And, and you know, that, that's kind of the principle behind terrorism, isn't it? Random violence that, that terrorizes people. So uh, the, the friends want to distance themselves from Job and uh, really... They, they had come to comfort him, but in the end, they become antagonistic toward him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they show us in some ways what not to do when you're trying yeah. to comfort somebody in the midst of suffering. Yeah. So they fail uh, to comfort Job. And then we get a, another friend named Elihu who, who comes in. Uh, and then after that friend, finally, God responds to Job. And God appears to Job in a whirlwind. And Job's res uh, God's response is also a kind of whirlwind of rhetorical questions. Yeah. Uh, have you created these things? Were you there when I created the world? Could you run the world any better than I could? You know, this is basically the kind of questions that God is putting towards Job. He describes all of his creation, uh, and he takes Job on a kind of safari tour <laughs> through a lot of the animals in his creation. It's a kind of strange thing um, why this is the answer that Job needs in the midst of his suffering to hear about how God feeds the baby ravens and is like a midwife to the mountain goats up on the mountains. And then we get the description of these terrifying creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan. Uh, and there's a lot of debate, and we go into that, uh, in the book on how we are supposed to understand what God is trying to get across to Job here. But um, as a kind of spoiler uh, for those who haven't yet read the book, uh, what we think is going on is God is expressing to Job that he can be trusted, that he mm -hmm. is in control. He cares for his creation. So the mention of him providing food for the ravens is a lot like what Jesus says, uh, where he says, you know, will not a sparrow fall to the ground without my father knowing it? Uh, or consider the lilies, right? These kinds of ideas that we encounter in the New Testament. But he is also sovereign over the chaos of creation. So as terrifying as the behemoth and the Leviathan may be, they are not greater than God and his power. And so Job can trust God. And that leads Job to respond to God. And this is a debated point, uh, how we understand Job's response exactly. 
most English translations say something like Job repents in dust and ashes. Uh, but the Hebrew word that's used there, that's translated repent, uh, it appears several other times earlier in the book, and every other time it appears it's translated is consoled or comforted. Uh, right. So we argue that it should be understood that way here in this place. So 42.6, when God appears to Job and, ex and describes his power, but also his love for his creation, Job is responding, I am comforted by what you've revealed to me. Wow. And that leads into what I said earlier about then immediately after that, God approving of what Job has said and actually rejecting the friends approach. The friends were trying to defend God, but they defend God by attacking Job. And then only then does God restore to Job twice what he's lost. So he reconciles his relationship with Job. Job comes to God in faith before he gets everything back. I think that's an important part of the story. Uh, and then God makes everything right in the end. I think it's helpful to recognize, and sometimes we don't like this, but the book of Job does not give an answer as mm -hmm. to why there is suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. If you look to the book of Job for that answer, you will not find it. Uh, in fact, Job in the story never knows what, what had been going on in the heavenly council. He's never told about this deal that God had made with Satan and the challenge of the Satan and so forth. Uh, and, and so this revelation of God doesn't answer Job's questions as much as reveal something of the grandeur, the wonder, the power, and the goodness of God himself. Mm. And, and there's a sense in which Job's vision of who God is gets bigger. And I think it's significant because we, we in our human arrogance, sometimes think, well, I, if I can't understand it, it can't be true. If I can't understand it, I can't trust it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of like a, a child, a four-year-old, <laughs> not understanding why a parent gives a command and then, then disobeys it, you know. And, and, and so Job, in some ways, is put in his place, but he responds well to that. And that's, that's a good thing. You know, I, I think it's been said that if, if your God is small enough to be understood, he's not big enough to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. And I think Job comes to the conclusion that God is big enough to be worshipped. He knows more about his world and the ordering of his world than I do. And I can accept what he gives me, um, trusting that his ways are ultimately good and right. Yeah. Oh, man, you make me want to read Job all over again. I mean, it just, <laughs> it's, it's just such a beautiful yet difficult book. And I'm all about application in my life. When I hear a message, you know, the, the word, I'm like, okay, how do I apply this to my life? So um, you guys touched upon this a little bit, but I want you to elaborate more on it. Like, what are some assumptions people have about life being hard? that the Bible addresses, you know, what assumptions are right, what are wrong. I mean, and even hit on this day and age, the demographics that are represented, like what assumptions do we have? I think one assumption that people have is that <clears throat> uh, life shouldn't be hard. And I think that's right. Uh, life shouldn't be hard. And the Bible affirms it shouldn't be hard. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, it, when we encounter this hardness in our life, that that is the result necessarily of sin, uh, or that if someone's a Christian, they should never encounter hard things, difficult things in life, right? Um, I mean, Jesus says as much, right? In, in this world, you will face trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, so uh, the Christian faith does not deny the hardness of life. Uh, it says, yes, life is hard because we live in a world that's broken. It's not what it should be. But it also doesn't give in to the hardness of life. Uh, it gives us hope in the midst of that. And the book of Job is amazingly honest, like the rest of scripture, in acknowledging that there are really hard things in this life. And even the most righteous man is not going to escape those hard things. Mm -hmm. But it also is hopeful <laughs> in that there is a God 
Uh, and this God is greater than those hard things that we face. And this God is trustworthy in the midst of those hard things. But as Bill just said, doesn't mean we're always going to understand why. Job is never told why he suffered in the way that he did. Uh, but it does encourage us not to give up. Uh, and so that's that's what Job is praised for in the New Testament in James 5, 11, that he endured. Uh, and that is what the book challenges us to do is to endure as well as we face the hard things in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's important that what is the Christian faith offer to sufferers? And I think one of the most important things is that it puts our suffering in a bigger story. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a grand narrative that the, the gospel message gives to us that says, yes, this world can be hard. Yes, this world is broken. Uh, but God is involved. God is active. And, and God is actually has a plan for overcoming the fallenness of this world. And that makes a huge difference as we're thinking about our suffering. Our suffering is not meaningless. It doesn't have, it, it's not without purpose. Uh, and even Job's suffering has a purpose where he sees God in a new and deeper way as a result of that suffering. Um, and, you know, and again, putting this in the whole of the, the biblical narrative is Jesus overcomes the suffering of this world ultimately through his resurrection and glory. Mm -hmm. He overcomes sin and death. He enters into this new realm and, and, and the promises that we will one day enter into that realm. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is for us in this age to persevere in faith in the midst of suffering and hold on to the, the promise that God has that one day there will be a world in which there is no pain, there is no grief, there is no suffering. Uh, and that's a challenge. And that's why, you know, when we think of suffering, we often don't just think of it as affliction, but as a trial. You go through trials because suffering tests our faith. Suffering makes us wrestle with the fact, is there really a good God out there who is not only good, but great, who somehow allows this suffering into my life, but is still good and is still great and has a purpose that one day I can understand, but not now, I won't. Can I trust him? And again, as a Christian, you keep going back to the fact that God has revealed himself as a God who comes near to us in our suffering. Jesus enters into this world. He sees the, the death of his dear friend Lazarus and he weeps. Mm. And yet he doesn't just sympathize with our suffering. Ultimately, he saves us from it. Uh, through his death and resurrection, overcoming sin, overcoming death, and points us to that glorious new world that is to come. So that's the grand story that the Bible presents to us. And, and, and in that story, our suffering can find some, some meaning, some purpose that's very helpful. So I, I want to go a little off script here. Um, and I, I'm actually going to direct questions to both of you. So you know, as a modern reader, um, this all starts because God gambles. Okay. So God says, <laughs> God says, Hey, have you tried my servant Job? And Bill, what you just said was like super beautiful, but this whole story starts because God's like, I'm sure Job's going to get through it. So, you know, it makes me think of, um, the movie trading spaces, our trading places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, spoiler alert, it's about 40 years old, but like the whole point of the movie is like they bet a dollar, you know, the two bosses bet a dollar that they can train Eddie Murphy to do the job. And at the end, like Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, like basically take the stock market and bet a dollar that they can make them go bankrupt. Like that's the picture that like I'm getting about this wager. And so, where I'd kind of like to go with this is, first of all, Will, how would the original readers have read that wager? And then Bill, you know, as a pastoral response, like how would how would you talk to someone that'd be like, okay, you're telling me this all works out for good, but here's a God that's basically like, hey, I'm I'm gonna kind of ruin your life, maybe make it better. 
just to prove Satan wrong. So Will, maybe help us understand what the original readers might have saw, and then Bill, you know, follow up response to that. The context of the original readers is likely one in which they understand the role of the Satan character a little differently than we do. Uh, so the Satan in the Hebrew has the definite article on it. It's the Satan, which suggests it's not a name of a figure as much as the, the name of a role that some kind of celestial figure plays. And that the Hebrew word Satan means to accuse. So it's his job kind of like a prosecuting attorney to test the faith of people and see if it's genuine or not. Uh, and in that role, he kind of plays a positive purpose. He has a positive purpose and he's testing people's faith. And that's what he does with Job is um, he's testing his faith to see if it, um, to see if it stands the test, if it's genuine. Uh, now, you can see how that role gets melded with a number of other people or other figures who oppose God or other depictions of opponents to God. And by Revelation 12, they're all merged together and described as, you know, the devil who is Satan, who is the dragon, right? They're all, they all come together. But for the ancient readers, they may have understood the Satan as playing this role of testing the genuineness of people's faith, uh, which means that when God allows this wager to occur, he's giving Job the opportunity to demonstrate the genuineness of his faith, which also fits for ancient readers with what we see in a several other places in the Old Testament where God tests his faithful ones, right? Abraham is tested uh, by being asked to take Isaac and uh, sacrifice him. And these are difficult texts for us to read. Uh, you know, they challenge us in lots of different ways. And yet from a pastoral perspective, I've actually found it encouraging to think about the suffering that I might face in my life as an opportunity to live out my faith uh, and to see its genuineness, uh, to have it proven, tested. Uh, so Job himself talks about himself being refined by fire, which is an idea that gets picked up elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, so when we face, we don't know, you know, what is celestially behind the scenes going on uh, when we face different situations of suffering. But Job presents to us a, a picture of a situation in which the celestial beings are watching to see how we'll respond as we face these difficult challenges in our lives. And we mm -hmm. have the opportunity to glorify God through being faithful. Oh. Yeah. That idea that uh, Job doesn't suffer because he's an enemy of God, but instead suffers because he's a friend of God. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a hard one for us to grasp, but at the same time, it's, it could be encouraging uh, that suffering is not necessarily a sign of God's anger, but he is entrusting his reputation to us. Mm. And we have an opportunity to bring him honor and bring him glory by persevering in our faith in the midst of those trials. And and it's just, you know, the, this, this notion that the, the angels in heaven are watching that our lives are on this grand stage and, and somehow the way we act out, the way we live, the way we respond uh, has cosmic implications. That's just astounding, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. just astounding. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, one of the messages of the book, that here is this one man's life. And it has this glor God glorifying dimension that he holds firm to faith, though the, it's difficult, though he's defiant, though he argues, he still remains faithful to God. Mm -hmm. And his faith is, is proved to be genuine and God receives the glory. Yes, God is, in fact, worthy of our worship, uh, even when we don't enjoy the benefits of his blessing. Uh, that's a that's a great theme, and, and we can participate in that story in our own suffering. So, yeah, I think there there are lessons here for us, uh, challenges for us, but I think it can strengthen our faith uh, through the midst of the challenges that we will ne necessarily face. I I appreciate that because I I think um, 
I think that Christianity usually gets challenged about this question. Um, and you can go back to, I just talked with someone that said to me, um, you know, why, why was the tree that Adam and Eve sinned even in the garden? And we don't have time to open that up. So, uh, but like there, there's kind of this odd, like what's the alternative? So I, I guess as we think about this question, why do I have to feel happy if life's hard? You both have established like the Bible is really clear that life is hard. Um, you know, and, and we don't have time to kind of discuss other religions. There's different levels of what they deem happiness and things like that. So I, I guess, you know, what, what I'm concerned about is when we talk about suffering there, there's a pastoral practical way of talking about it that like my friend has cancer, you know, my wife lost a baby, I'm still single, I haven't gotten married. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this philosophical, theological way that we're trying to talk about it. And and believe it or not, we do that in culture. So, you know, how do you both manage that tension? Because this is not just some ancient book. Like, this is 2023 when this podcast is going to come out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you manage that tension as you kind of, practically kind of engage it but also apply it let me let me jump in i uh i mentioned the friends job's friends and the way they uh interact with job and they uh i like how one commentator puts it they they assume the role of the uh armchair scholar debating philosophical theological issues rather than the seat of the wheelchair sufferer they're too busy rationalizing and don't sympathize. And and I think that's, uh, you know, as I think of suffering pastorally, the first thing is to to, to come alongside, be with, share, and, and sympathize, empathize with the person who's going through suffering, which these friends don't appear to do. Uh, so I think just being present, uh, demonstrating your love, because often when people suffer, they feel alone, they feel abandoned, uh, they feel abandoned ultimately by God. Hmm. And so being there, being the, the presence of God, the, 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 the evidence of the love of God in people's lives is, I think, the, the first and primary thing that you want to do when you're engaged with people who are suffering. Uh, it's not the time for sermons. It's not the time for philosophical uh, argumentation. It's the time for... Uh, loving care and, and loving presence. Now, there's a time to talk about, you know, what does this mean? How can I understand this? Uh, but I don't think uh, that's where you begin at all. Mm -hmm. I would just add, you know, the, the question we're thinking about today is why do I feel I have to be happy all the time if life is hard? Uh, and one of the great pastoral gifts that the book of Job gives us, which we've pointed to already, is you don't have to feel happy all the time. <laughs> uh, Job, is not, Job is not happy for most of the book. Uh, and he actually brings that frustration to God. Uh, and we call that in the, our book, Defiant Faith. It's faith, but it has a defiant edge to it because Job defies his situation. He says, it's not the way that things are supposed to be. I'm a righteous man, and yet you're allowing me to suffer in that way. Um, and so... Here we have a book of the Bible that's encouraging us to be honest with God, authentic with God in the midst of our suffering. Uh, and that is actually a great gift that yeah, scripture yeah. gives us mm -hmm. in that yeah. I think the church, you know, implied in your question is that the church gives people the impression that they have to be happy all the time. And I think that's true that that does come across to many people. Uh, there's an article that Carl Truman wrote um, called what do miserable Christians sing? What do miserable Christians sing? Because all of the songs that we sing at church are all, you know, happy worship songs. And, and one of the things I've noticed actually in recent years, and I don't know how much COVID has influenced this, but there is a kind of retrieval of lament uh, in churches. Uh, and churches are starting to recognize that they need to provide resources for mm -hmm. people who don't feel happy when they enter the doors. Uh, and there are incredible resources in Scripture, like Job, like the Lament Psalms, uh, that enable people to bring that suffering to God, to bring that unhappiness to God and show 
over and over again that God meets people in that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, when I preached uh, this series, that was one of the responses that was uh, most common. People said, thank you for this because I have felt like Job. I've had these thoughts and I felt like I couldn't express them. I felt like they were wrong mm -hmm. and they felt guilty for it. And I think the book of Job gives you a freedom to be honest with God. Mm. And that's very important because, as it's been said, uh, true prayer is the true me communicating with the true God. Yeah. And I can't be putting on a facade. I can't pretend that I'm happy and joyful when I'm not. Mm. And God can handle it. And that's yeah. part of what the message tells us. God can handle it. Be honest with God. Mm. Uh, wrestle with God. Don't give up on God. And that's the thing. I mean... Uh, you know, this is not uh, this is not wandering from the faith because Job keeps coming back to God, and and that's what I encourage people to do who are struggling. I say keep bringing those struggles to God, mm -hmm. and Job I think is the example that uh, liberates Christians to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we you know we'll we'll read in Paul where he says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Again, I say, rejoice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Paul is, himself talks about being despairing unto death in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when he faced difficult times. Uh, Job talks about the whole creation groaning as in childbirth to the present day. So Paul recognized that life is hard. And, uh, but there is a sense in which the reality, the overarching reality of the gospel gives us a ground for hope and even for joy in the midst of our suffering, because God's power to overcome the fallenness and brokenness of the world is greater than the suffering we endure. So there is ultimately a ground for joy and hope, but we still live in a fallen world and makes it hard, and, and God doesn't deal with us as we like. Uh, and so there's a sense in which we protest. And Jesus himself gives us warrant for this. He talks about that, that parable of the persevering widow who wrestles with the unjust judge and continues to plead her case until finally, out of desperation, the judge agrees to do it. Jesus uses that illustration as, a, as an encouragement to persevering faith in the midst of what appears to be an unjust world. So... I kind of want to go off script again because I, I think this is fairly important. Um, so we have listeners that um, might not be Christians. They might be deconstructing. And and I, I guess I'd be curious. And when I say deconstructing, I don't um, – I have two PhDs here, so I have to make sure I define my terms. Not necessarily <laughs> like the French deconstructing, but kind of this new modern phenomenon, American deconstructing of faith. And – and this issue of happiness, life being hard, and suffering is such a block to following Jesus. And I think both of you have articulated well that the church has kind of failed. Um, if you want Google 538, they did a whole thing about the songs we sing in Christian radio, and like 95% of them were happy, they weren't sad, kind of the Carl Truman thing. How... Talk to that listener that's deconstructing or that's not a Christian. Like, how has going through the book of Job helped you kind of connect and maybe articulate in a new way to this new phenomenon that's going on? Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but because, again, suffering is kind of one of those big blocks that people have. How are you engaging people in those seasons? One of the things that often motivates deconstruction is a experience of a very superficial Christian faith uh, that people have had in churches growing up. And <clears throat> the kind of faith, the kind of church experience where Job was never preached. <laughs> we just avoid these hard texts and these hard ideas. and. So this is where instead of running away from these kinds of difficult issues, we take them head on 
Mm. We have a great opportunity to grow in our faith. So I teach undergraduates here in Birmingham, Alabama. And um, one of the classes I teach is just an introduction to the Bible for students who maybe have no background in the Bible at all, or maybe have grown up in exactly the kind of context that I just described. And I tell them the very first day of class, we are not going to shy away from any of these difficult texts or difficult questions that scripture raises. Um, and C.S. Lewis talks about this, about it's actually in those places where those parts of the Bible that we find most repellent, he says, <laughs> that we have the greatest opportunity to grow in our faith. But it's similar to what Bill was just saying. That happens if we continue to wrestle. If we continue to wrestle, we don't give up. Uh, that we get the opportunity to grow. But if we have a very anemic faith that's built on that superficial foundation, we face the challenge of a text or a life event and it overwhelms us and we just give up. Uh, and so texts like this, life experiences, you know, not even to Job's level, but challenges, uh, those have the opportunity to build our faith if we put them in the right context. Uh, and I just had a student in my office right before coming on with you who was struggling with these kinds of questions, who was in that class with me. Uh, and one of the things that I encouraged her to do is, is find a church uh, where other people could come alongside her. And I told her, you know, one of the gifts that God gives us is scripture. And so, you know, we can read the book of Job, but another gift he gives us is a congregation of people who are all wrestling together. This is where Job's mm -hmm. friends fail him completely. They were supposed to come alongside him and comfort him. Uh, and where the church today is often failing is it's a bunch of individuals who go to a building and sing some songs together uh, instead of a community where we enter into one another's suffering together and support one another. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes feel like some people who are deconstructing are not deconstructing real Christianity, mm. but a very shallow version of it. And, and I think that's sad. Um, and I, I think, you know, as Will was saying, I think digging deeper into what the gospel and the biblical message really is uh, would be helpful for those people. Mm. Man, I feel like we went to class, we read the book, you know, we we went to the pub that C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien went, um, you know, we went really deep and I, I appreciate uh, both of you. So what we like to do, um, and Amanda and I aren't intimidated at this all, we close every episode with the question, what does Jesus have to say about this topic? So the good news is, is usually we have one guest that cleans up the mess that we leave. Now we have two guests. So I'll let you all uh, kind of go there. So um, Amanda, do you want me to go first or would you like to go first? Or... I'll go first. Oh, look at you go. Yeah, yeah. Right. you know, why not? Um, when I saw the question for the podcast, I also just want to give a shout out to anyone who thought of Inside Out like I did, the movie, oh. that, you know, mm. and you guys touched upon this too, like sadness has a place in our faith and it's mm. going to be there and it actually can bring beauty out of a very difficult thing. So I thought of the verse that's, that's Matthew eleven twenty eight, and Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I, a couple things about that I love is that Jesus saying, come to me if you're weary, come to me if you're heavy laden. And in that, I'm sure the sadness and depression and uncertainty. And Jesus says, I'll give you rest. You know, I will provide something for you. And I know he's speaking truly into who he is, not just, you know, a way out or an answer to, you know, your struggles. Just, I will be your rest. I'll be your person. Um, so I just love Jesus' heart in that. Man, I appreciate that a ton. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go deep into the Bible. I, I, I do want to kind of, something that came up as, you know, what Will and Bill talked about was, you know, I, I don't think we challenge the alternatives to Christianity as much as we should. And I, I think what Jesus would say about this is, you know, why do I feel happy if life is hard all the time? Well, you know, I, I see things like send good vibes or, uh, you know, just we live in this world. Even the world has a hashtag for bless. Um, and I, I don't think that the answers outside of Christianity are 
are actually as helpful as we think they are. Like whether it's having more stuff or hedonism or volunteering more or like the pressure comes back to us. Whereas, you know, I think what Jesus has to say about this topic is like take the pressure off from being happy. And when you embrace that life is hard, life becomes beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, I think both Will and Bill said this about the suffering of the cross leads to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And there's something so powerful about that. So I think where I'm leaving this conversation is, you know, if you're in a season of doubt, it's, you know, like what Will said, please challenge Christianity and make sure you're challenging it in a deep way, but make sure you're also challenging the other thought systems like the American dream and other things with the same vigor. Because I think what you find is even if you get everything you want, there's actually a suffering in realizing it's not as much as you think it is. Yeah. I appreciate that uh, looking at the alternatives because the alternative, uh, you know, how could a good God allow such suffering? I can't believe in such a God. What's the alternative? You end up like the Satan, cynical, believing there is no such thing as goodness, truth, and beauty. There is no such thing as ultimate injustice because there's no source of justice. We just live and die, and that's the end of it. And I think that's the ultimate alternative to the Christian story. And what does Jesus say to all this? I think the, the passage that Will alluded to earlier, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Peace I leave with you, he says, not as the world gives. Peace I, live with, I leave with you. So I think there is a, a place for peace. There is a place for meaning, uh, even in the midst of the troubles and trials of this life. Because God is God, and he is great and glorious and worthy of our worship. I just have yeah. to stop for one second here because, Will, how many times has your dad given you the last word? Your dad is literally... <laughs> I, I'll be honest. He, you seem like you both have given it before. Anyways, Will, go ahead and answer the question. Uh, well, you know, I'll do what I often do, which is say, I can't say it much better than he just did, uh, but uh -huh. I'll just add on to it um, that uh, I think this is a good reminder of the way that Job is, it puts Job's suffering, which we see in those middle chapters as he really wrestles with God in the context of a narrative. And it's a narrative that has a happy ending in which God makes things right in the end. And a lot of readers don't like that. They, they want it to be a true tragedy. But we argue in the book that that's actually perfectly appropriate. And it affirms that God is in the end just and does make things right, which gives anyone who suffers hope. Mm. Uh, and to the point of what's the alternative, can you find another narrative that is going to enable you to persevere through suffering? Uh, and it made me think of, you know, Jesus says some really hard things to his followers in John 6, and a lot of disciples leave him. And so he says in 667 to the 12, do you want to go as, away as well? And Peter responds, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I worry for those who deconstruct and walk away from this narrative. Are they finding something that's going to enable them to respond to the vicissitudes of life when they arise? Uh, and as hard as it may be, um, Jesus offers us the hope that there will be a happy ending. Uh, which it can be vitally important for people who are suffering to believe that that will be true so that they won't give up. Mm. Well, uh, before we let everyone go, uh, the book, uh, uh, Wrestling with Job, uh, through our great friend Krista Clayton, if you, uh, after this episode airs for two weeks, if you use the code YGOD, you can get 30% off at IVP.com. We're going to be sharing that, so make sure you buy this book. Uh, Will and Bill, where can people find you online? 
Well, <laughs> people, people who want uh, to hear more about Job, they could go and listen to my podcast called The Two Testaments, which is at thetwotestaments.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And we did a season with 10 episodes on the book of Job with leading biblical scholars where we walked through it passage by passage, uh, talking about in much more depth some of these questions about how to interpret it and, and understand it today. So that'd be one place where they could go or they could find me on Twitter at Will Kinds. And Bill, I don't know what your social media. <laughs> You're also on Twitter. You have like five followers. <laughs> uh, you know, if somebody wanted to interact with me, they could email me at billkinds at gmail.com. As simple as that. Old school. Hey. I love it. Hey, hey, you know, that's that's the way we are. Anyways, if you want to get a. Uh... If you want to get in touch with us, you go to whygodwhypodcast.com, click the subscribe button. You'll get this episode and many others. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm-hmm.